is Monday, March 20th, 2023, and this is a work session for Salisbury City Council. Following the work session, we will have a special meeting uh, to uh, address one of the items uh, that we're going to be speaking about during the work session. Uh, first item up on the agenda is going to be a resolution to establish an endowment fund for the Ann Street Village. And here we have our Housing and Community Development Director, Ron Strickler. Mr. Strickler. Okay. Are they going to be able to hear me here? Or you just yeah. Talk loudly. We're good. Talk loud. We're good. Okay. So I do apologize. I uh, started getting a migraine like 20 minutes ago, so vision's a little blurry. Uh, actually, uh, Brett Sanders is here with us, our housing and homeless manager. Um, he's going to outline the program today. Um, so, Brett, you want to take over? I mean, essentially, the, the program will support uh, Ann Street Village and other programs that we offer through uh, Housing and Homeless Division of uh, Community and Development. Yep, sure. I'll get this button here. I should just talk and it should. Okay. Hopefully. Um, yeah, so um, this uh, idea was brought to us um, from the Community Foundation, um, and it's to address the need of how do we solicit the public for donations um, for the project in a way that um, is structured and has accountability and um, also uh, gives the public a, a good um, platform to do so. Um, and we think that uh, the relationship with the Community Foundation is a, a good relationship to do that. Um, they offered us um, a non-endowed community uh, uh, needs fund. And um, what that looks like is it has a 1% operating cost um, the drawdown is a minimum of $1,000 that has to be in the account, and um, it'll operate in a way where we, if we have an emergency expense or um, an operating need on site or an operating need within homeless services, we can contact the community foundation, and they, we can sort of have an open granting process where we let them know how much we need from the fund, and um, they will make that fund. Straightforward. Um, that's kind of how the setup works. Um, they have donor advisors um, that, when there are big ticket donors that come to the foundation, they sort of help them figure out what initiatives in the community they'd like to support. And they've indicated that homelessness is an initiative that many of their donors have indicated they would like to help with. Um, and that's when they came to us and asked if we could sit down and have a conversation about how to get this um, off the ground. And it'll support a wide variety of functions at Ann Street Village um, and citywide through the homeless initiatives, um, utilities, uh, operational costs. Um, as Brett said, emergency costs. We've been working with a communications team here with the city. They've done a really good job of setting up a, um, an outline of what the program like, look different levels of sponsorship based off of the costs associated with each individual um, unit. Uh, transitional dwelling unit as well as the bathroom shower facility some name recognition should folks uh, be interested in that piece um, you know we've already had some strong donations on the on the on the front end you know as we're building uh, building the site up uh, so you know I think it'll be a good way to recognize those in our community that are going to continue to support our homeless initiatives any uh, questions from the council uh, Chris I'm going to just so everybody, everybody knows, we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, but I'm going to start with uh, Miss Jackson. She's online, joining us by Zoom. You have any questions or comments? Oh. Yeah, I think she said that. Megan, Megan, do you have any Megan. questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, is it coming through all right on your end? We can hear you. We can hear you. Perfect. Um, yeah, I just had a question on the units. I know it was just briefly mentioned, but I it was a little bit on the softer end right there. Um, do is it possible for us to receive the cost it is to maintain and you know keep those un individual units going? Yeah, we do have um, we do have a projected budget um, for FY twenty four uh, for expected costs, uh, more so around utilities, uh, but also uh, coverage for the facility. Um, and we're working through a program right now, hoping to get some, um, you know, some personnel coverage at uh, very little to no cost to the city. 
uh, which will make things a little bit better for us. And, you know, you're going to have odds and ends. A lot of that will come through donations of, of goods, toilet paper, shower, um, sh you know, washcloths, towels, um, those types of things. But yeah, we, we, we do have a projected budget that you know, we'll be sharing, event sharing with, with council. Thank you. The only question I had uh, was about the fees that it was going to cost uh, for them to manage this. Just wanted to get an idea of like what kind of percentage of the budget we're looking at for the fees to, to manage this fund. Sure. Um, so so the, it's just going to be a 1% percent percent annual fee. Okay. That's not bad. And it's, um, the initial startup fee is $5,000. It's okay. typically $10,000, but they cut it in half for us. Excellent. That's awesome. And, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody knows, I believe the um, regular rate is 7% of, of the endowed the endowed fund. So it is a drastic reduction. Yeah, I was going to say that was, that, I was, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's actually great. That's awesome. Oh, that's a good point. So they, with this fund, typically they would put a community interest fund in the stock market, but their, ours is going to be out of the stock market. That's what makes it the money readily available to us. As a non-endowed fund, which means it's yes, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, I don't have any. I don't have any questions, and I, I think this is a. This is really good. It's going to help us uh, manage this this site and, and other issues, and so this and allows those who want to contribute more uh, to it. So this is, I think, a very really good thing. So do we have consensus to move forward? April. April. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 I have one question, and I'm not for sure if he did state that during his conversation, but I kind of like was hearing a lot of feedback myself. But does do how many people are we going to house, and how are we going to choose those people to house? So we're going to be housing 24 uh, clients. Um, and they'll be program participants. And the way we have developed our wait list is um, working together with other agencies in the COC. Um, we've identified the folks who have been outside the longest in Wacomico County. Um, so our wait list starts with people who have been outside for 15 years, and then we work backwards from 15 years, 10 years, and then the next tier is five. And um, below five, we really have a, a close range of folks who have been outside between one year and three years. And they're the folks we consider after the folks who have been very long term outside. I can hear you guys. I don't know if April can, though. My whole screen went out. We can hear you, April. I think we're good. Hey, can can you hear us? I hear you, but I'm like, something happened. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> did, did you hear his response? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. He okay. gave a response to your question. Uh, something, my, my computer just went. Oh, okay. oh, okay. If you want to repeat that so she can hear it, sure. I appreciate it. Exact same way. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we've been working with the, with the continuum of care, the halls, lower shore, um, and all the providers and homeless services. And we developed a list of folks who've been outside the longest. And we're starting by offering spaces to the people who have been outside for 15 years. And then we're going to be working backwards from 15 down to one year. So um, we have a, a wait list of about 41 people. And the initial 24 are all folks who have been outside between 15 and three years. And if folks do say no, then we'll go 
and start looking at the folks who are outside between one and three years that also have severe mental health illnesses or physical disabilities, and that's how they'll move up into that priority list um, to be considered with the folks who've been outside the longest. Okay. Are, are you support the resolution? Yes. Megan? Yes. Okay. Sure. All right, so we have consensus. We'll place this on our agenda next week. Okay. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Mayor, did you need me to stick around for the uh, commercial vehicle discussion? Or? Sure. Okay. You Thanks, All right, our next item on the agenda is an ordinance to approve a budget amendment to appropriate funds for the fire department's uh, vehicle repair account. So we have Deputy Chief here. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? Doing good. You got supervision in the audience today? What's that? <laughs> yeah, my boss is watching me <laughs> over my shoulder. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Always watching. Sorry. <clears throat> Yes, as you said, um, I'm here today uh, to ask for a budget amendment of $50,000 uh, to go into our vehicle's account. Um, there's a couple things that this is going to help cover. Uh, one, for our Fireboat One, uh, it is actually due uh, this coming fiscal year for its uh, manufacturer recommended 1,000 hour service. Um, and then the other part is we, re we have been recently advised. Uh, during one of the uh, maintenance, uh, preventive maintenance on the fire boat, that both turbos are in need of being pulled. Uh, they are leaking and exhaust is getting into the cab. So therefore making it unsafe for our operators. Um, our thought process was to obviously knock two birds out with one stone while it was out of service for one time, try to get both of them done. Uh, unfortunately, our current budget uh, does not cover this cost. Uh, it's going to be roughly around $16,000. Uh, we currently do not have the money in our current budget to cover that. The rest of the money will, will also help us for the rest of this fiscal year uh, to cover any unexpected costs. And we also have uh, some expected costs that we know are coming, uh, both all our rescue truck, uh, and two of our older engines are in need of some repairs. Questions or comments on, on this issue? April, any questions or comments? Please. You good with doing no. this board? Yeah. Okay. All right. You have consensus to move this to next week. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate thank, it. Thank you. Next up is a resolution to approve the donation of a canine. Colonel Dave Mineshine, present and accounted for. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think we're in the in-between time here. but uh, um, It's my pleasure to address you today for a, a donation of a canine uh, through uh, what's an international, a national company called uh, Throwaway Dog Program. Uh, this particular canine has a value of about six, uh, well, actually now has a value of about $12,000. Uh, what we're doing is accepting the donation of the dog that came pre-trained in some police function. Uh, our goal is to um, train the dog in a specific need that we have with all the city events right now that we're getting coming to town, and that would be uh, for an accelerant or a bomb dog. We have, currently have one. However, uh, we're desperately in need of another with all the events. A one dog to cover everything is, is, uh, would benefit us greatly to have another dog. This particular dog came to us um, from another program, just to give you a little history of this particular animal. Um, this dog was trained for bed bug detection. And uh, for what re one reason or another, one was uh, the temperament of the dog and so forth, uh, didn't make it through the bed bug program but was deemed uh, and vetted out to be good for police function. This company has a history of donating to veteran services if the dog suits that purpose and primarily for canine or for police uh, purpose. Uh, the dog has uh, successfully managed to get through the training without a hitch. Uh, how we found, how we came in uh, to custody of the dog or, or about to come in custody of the dog was through a Delmarva canine, a vendor that we use locally. 
um, have had several dogs trained through uh, Del Marva Canine. That's, that's uh, nothing but good things to say. Generally, a 10 out of 10 on these dogs. And what I'm, from my understanding, this dog has is, is, is worked out fine. So instead of the city incurring a cost of 12,000, 12,005 for this dog, uh, we are in need of a canine. We are short one canine now. And that we're really gonna be getting this dog at basically half the price. So for just to, to get the bomb accelerant work done, we're looking at a cost of about uh, $6,500, I believe it is. So um, the dog's ready to go otherwise. So um, that is all I have for that. If anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer. April, you have any questions? No, I don't, Mayor. Okay. Are you are you okay with moving this forward? Yes, I sure am. Megan, any, any questions? questions? No questions. I'm there. Okay. Good. All right. Let's just move this forward. Yep. Thank I you. Bring the dog in. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> we'll, we'll, do, we'll do a tour. He's gonna sniff out your office first. Right? Yeah. <laughs> now this this is a, I think it's gonna be good. It's gonna work out well for us. That's Thank awesome. you. Thank you very That's much. That's fantastic. Awesome. All right. So our next item uh, is gonna be a budget amendment to purchase and upfit four SPD vehicles. Colonel. Yes. Thank you again. So I'm here before you to discuss. Um, the, as as everyone knows, with the budget the way it is. Um, one of the critical items that we run into quite frequently is vehicle shortages. Um, we have an aging fleet. Uh, we do have quite a few vehicles on backwater. We can't wait for those to get here. Um, but what we are trying to do here is move um, just slightly less than $215,000 from, uh, from the general fund, which was from the dissolution of the Wicomico Task Force, uh, the city's share that we've received so far is uh, $214,189.35. What we would like to do with those funds is repurpose those to um, upfit our fleet um, with four vehicles. Um, one of those vehicles would go to our patrol uh, function, uh, two to our criminal investigation function, and one to our recruiting function. Our goal there is to um, what we really need in our recruiting piece is to just put something out there so when these uh, young potential recruits uh, see us driving down the road, they, they don't see us in an old, they don't see us in an old vehicle. We want something out there that looks good. Uh, so we're uh, looking at some designs there to have this vehicle uh, help us out with some recruiting with the, with the idea that we can repurpose that vehicle to patrol function or, or whatnot when we feel that the need is there. Um, so that's that's our uh, that's what we have for you there for uh, for the purpose of those funds, which doesn't uh, no need right now to take any money out of general funds. We're just looking to use those funds wisely, and this this look like a perfect project, knowing that we need vehicles in our fleet right now. So that's what we would like to do with those funds. April, you have any questions? No, Mayor. Okay, <clears throat> okay. we're moving this forward. Yes. Megan, any questions or comments? Uh, just one question. I, I I caught just a clip out of it. Where are we moving this from again? This is this is, this is coming out of the general fund. It's equi it was put in an account called equitable sharing equitable sharing account. Um, this was from the dissolution of the Wacomico Task Force. This is the the city was uh, city police was a partner in that function. These funds are from the from the proceeds of the dissolution of that unit, and this is what we've received so far. We would expect another check to come in within the next six to eight months. Yeah. Okay, moving it forward. All right, thank you. Good, all right, so we have consensus move this forward. Place this on next week's agenda. Colonel Monshine, thank you, sir. Appreciate yep. it. Thank you. Uh, next up is a discussion about commercial vehicles on private property. Uh, I know, Ron has made himself available for this discussion. I know we've had several um, issues uh, over the past couple of months uh, pertaining to this. And so looking through the code when it comes to, and it's talking about the issue has been people being ticketed that were their vehicles were on private property. And I'm just gonna read uh, from the code what it says and then, and then we can begin our discussion. So it, under 10.32.040, uh, parking of certain vehicles uh, in residentially zoned districts. So it says, 
it is unlawful for any person to park a boat, boat trailer, bus, camping trailer, commercial motor vehicle, commercial trailer, farm tractor, house trailer, motorhome, pole trailer, road tractor, school vehicle, or school bus, semi-trailer, travel trailer, truck with a truck camper attached, truck with a load capacity exceeding three-fourths ton, truck camper or a truck tractor on any municipal parking lot, public street, alley, or public way located in a residentially zoned district within the corporate limits of the city of Salisbury. Um, so according to that, it says nothing about something being on your property, uh, unless there's another section of the code that says that. So um, I don't know if, if you if you have any input on that, uh, Ron. Yeah, it's in uh, section 17, uh, development standards. Okay. Um, I'm trying to pull it up here. <clears throat> So, Ron, just to loop you in, um, somebody spoke last uh, week in public comments about um, uh, their uh, work truck being parked um, in their yard um, and wanted it to be parked there. We got a ticket and then didn't want to have it parked on the street. So they were just asking if we would revisit that or understand a little bit more clarity. So I think we were wanting to talk about it. So Yeah, so the majority of the vehicles that, well, commercial vehicles that are being cited on residential properties are complaint driven uh, from neighbors, um, whether it's running, starting up in the morning. Um, I don't have the actual code pulled up here. I'm trying to pull it up, but it is under section 17 zoning uh, under development standards, basically list residential prop or res residential zoning districts in which commercial vehicles are not allowed to be parked on resident in residential properties so this 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 is something I think that we've discussed before uh, technically uh, any commercial vehicle um, Mary Kay um, you know ice cream truck anything that is used for commercial property or commercial um, vehicle it, it could be cited uh, we've talked about it previously there hasn't been any changes the majority of the complaints that we receive are related to dump trucks tractor trailers. Um, we've had some major issues um, over in the Marquis area with, um, with, with commercial vehicles, specifically a tractor trailer rig uh, that actually had caught fire not too long ago uh, while, while the um, property owner was working on it. So, you know, the, the code states what it does, which is why they're being cited. Um, you know, and like I said, I don't know that, I mean, if it's actively seen, you know, we now have a code enforcement officer that is specifically assigned to zoning violations. So there may have been a little bit of an uptake, uptick in enforcement uh, throughout the city, uh, but I don't think it's been over and above uh, anything that has occurred previously. Amir, if I can just add, you know, um, understanding, I think the original goals and intent was not necessarily me who've got, I've got my wrapped Honda Civic for my personal car um, is also my business vehicle as a, as a nuisance into the residential properties, but more of these commercial rigs. Um, so I think if there is discussion on that, um, modifying the type of vehicle we can identify, you know, if it's a residential passenger vehicle rather than a commercial rig, um, axles or, or size, shapes, that, that may be something that I think is the nature of the of the issue previously, I think, and a couple of the people that, and I, and I know Michelle had mentioned there, there was some other stuff going around, where, and I think your husband had had like something placed on his vehicle where it kind of right. like gave we, the appearance. We, it, yeah, we had that it was we an had official. A, we actually had a letter, email, or sent to us, mailed to us by someone, um, with the implication that it was coming from the city. Um, they picked the right one that day. <laughs> um, and it was somebody who just had gone and pulled up the code and was just mailing it to anybody who had a commercial vehicle parked. And my husband worked for Comcast at the time, and he had a, he had a, a Comcast vehicle out parked on the street because we lived there, and it was his day off. You know, so I mean, I think there's something to be said about the size of the vehicle. We have a lot of folks in this community that are, you know, they 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 use work trucks and that sort of thing. And I can understand something you know as large as as a tractor trailer, but there are a lot of folks who drive work vans in this community and take them home and drive them from work to home and back again in the, ne the next morning. So 
there might be some, I think there should be a discussion about the size of the vehicle. You know, a work van is very different from a tractor trailer. And, you know, and also, you know, I know people who are school bus drivers in, in my neighborhood that have mm -hmm. school buses in their yards. Does school bus count? You know, I mean, it's, you know, so I think there's some things we should look at, you know, because there are people who HVAC people, plumbers, other trades that don't have an office. They, they work out of their home or work out of their van. And, you know, I think that there's some consideration there because that's, you know, then we're forcing them to go find some other place to park their work vehicles uh, when they don't, they don't have another location. So I, I think that's consideration there as well. A lot of people are now working from home. Yes, yeah, and especially after their COVID. vehicles. And now I'm all on, I, now I do have a problem with tractor trailers, I do. Mm -hmm. um, it's an eyesore at, at many times and then you see them parked in and everywhere and it's dangerous in the community. But when I see like a, okay, a dump truck, it's his personal dump truck, it's his work dump truck it's in his yard. It's not in somebody else's yard. It's not on the street. It is in his yard. And I think, you know, as long as it hasn't become an eyesore or it's got a flat tire or it's not being maintained, the tags are not efficient, you know, or not up to date, then I could see us giving um, citations for that, that sort of thing. Or for, like I said, the track, the trailers, but when it becomes a work vehicle and a person, most of the time now, even when you work on a job, they give you a, a carry home vehicle. Xfinity does. Mm -hmm. A lot of those guys take their truck home. Mm -hmm. My nephew works for DNR. He takes his work truck home. So, I, I, you know, we've got to find a way to make this work for everybody. I'd like, I'd like to point, point out, out too, too, just, just real, real quick, quick one, one, one other thing, thing is that, is that a, lot a lot of these things. companies that these folks are working for that they don't own the company, like Comcast, the company requires them to park them on the street. It does, they are not allowed to park them in the driveway. So I know for a fact that that's a Comcast rule. So there's an issue there is if it's not on their property, if the company requires it to be parked on the street and not on their property, what can they do? They're kind of stuck between the city code and the the employment reg, uh, regulations, what, what their employer requires. So we need to be cognizant of that as well. We also should talk to Xfinity because if a person has a work vehicle and they have to take it home, um, to me, parking on the street is kind of being, being obstructive to other vehicles that are coming through. So I would think that they would allow them to park in the yards or in their driveways. It's, 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 it's a security it's, thing for them, and it's also it's also a. Um, well, I mean, now I'm just there's, saying there's, there's a couple of reasons for it, but I mean, I mean it, it, it's it's also um, an accessibility. If the truck breaks down, sometimes if someone parks it in the driveway, it's not accessible for a tow truck to come in and pull it. Because trust me, these guys put a lot of miles on these vehicles, um, and they go through them pretty quickly. Um, so I mean, that's part of the reason why they're required to park it on the street so it's accessible if it breaks down. <laughs> yeah. so, so in, in relation to the code that I was specifically referring to, it's 17.156.060. It's under development standards. It applies to R5, R8, and R10 zoning standards. And essentially under D2, um, no outside storage of trucks or vans used in the conduct of business shall be permitted. So that would be any commercial vehicle. Um, what was the we, number again? Uh, it's 17.156.060. It's under development standards. So it's basically a development standard set forth under residential zoning districts in the city. You know, we've, we've discussed this at length internally. Um, I think one way we could tackle this would be to go with a governed weight mm -hmm. of a vehicle. Um, we don't get a lot of complaints about Xfinity vehicles or Mary Kay vehicles or personal work vans. The majority of the complaints that we're receiving are related to dump trucks, um, tractor trailer rigs. Don't hear a whole lot about school buses, whether or not you know the school bus is, is conducting business. There might be other laws that prevent us from uh, outside maybe Maryland code that would prevent us from citing school buses. I don't know that to be fact. Um, but like I said, I think the, the one key thing is, is if they were to have a space 
inside to store these vehicles, if it was a, a pole building or something that they could pull into, it, it wouldn't be exposed, so it wouldn't be creating the issue. Um, th generally, the concern that, that we hear from most residents is they just don't want to look at a tractor trailer in the front of somebody else's house across from them or next to them or whether the noise when they start them up to warm them up in the morning, the air brakes, all those different things. Uh, we can definitely look at addressing it, but I think one of our best courses could be to look at like a governed weight so we're not necessarily affecting what might be a pickup truck. Uh, Chesapeake Utilities is just an example. You know, I know a lot of those guys have take home vehicles too. Um, you know, so that's something we might be able to, to move forward, but I, I don't necessarily know that we're gonna be able, uh, I think you'll hear complaints from both sides, um, you know, and I think there's probably a lot more folks that would be on the side of, you know, not wanting tractor trailers or dump trucks in, in the uh, residential zones. Yeah, if I could add, I was involved in writing some of this language, uh, and I would concede that perhaps it could be better written. But the intent at the time was that for somebody with a, an Xfinity vehicle or you know, ABC plumbing or what have you, they would be allowed to park that vehicle on their property because it is a take home vehicle. And it was really geared more toward addressing these larger vehicles that uh, Ron is talking about. So I think even when it was written some number of years ago, the intent was that you could have a work vehicle either on your property or on the street. So there's a couple ways. Um, since it's complaint driven, I don't know, and Ashley may want to weigh in, if it is our interpretation of the way it says it, so we can define these as not commercial vehicles, so Ron would not have it cited, or if we need to clean up the language within the zoning code to actually define commercial or heavyweight commercial versus passenger vehicle to make it an easier, more definable attack, if we want to address it. I, I think it, even though... We, we write a law, but our intent is not to do something else. When we're not here anymore, and we understand how that, what the intent was, 15 years down the road, somebody views it as something else. I think when we, when we do this, we should clean it up, and we should be very intentional about what we're covering. And if it's not there, then it's not covered. So uh, I think if, if the... I think like like you said where it's more by weight and then you know specifically tractor trailers you know th those shouldn't really be in a residential neighborhood because they're not they're not built for the streets they're not built to come in and out of somebody's driveway because that's just not they're, they're just too big for that i i would also look at the one that uh julie printed for us today that we Whatever we do in the zoning code, that this matches, because they say two different things, yeah, and, two and, different parts of the code. And section ten, you know, that's something that code enforcement would not enforce. And that, so what we've, I don't know if Dave's still in the room or not, but a lot of times what will have happened is if we'll go out, and again, we're not citing the vehicle immediately. We are issuing a corrective action letter, which involves no court process. It, it says, hey, you can't have this vehicle in your front yard or in your side yard or wherever you may have it, you have 10 days or 30 days to correct the issue. If you need an extension, we'll offer you that extension. It's not until the point that they've not corrected the issue that we've addressed, and that's when you get to the point that citations are written. Um, you know, and, and again, we are following what's in the code, and I, we can clean it up. I definitely think we can clean it up, but we'll, put it, we'll issue a corrective action letter, and, and that individual will then move the vehicle to the street. And that, Vehicle sit in the street, and then PD will come address that vehicle, and then they'll move it back into the into the driveway. So it's like this cat and mouse game. Um, and I know PD probably has a lot more important issues to deal with than commercial vehicles on the street. So you know, I do think that we could, uh, you know, we could definitely try and clean it up. But you know, obviously with some guidance, you know, what we want to move forward with would be helpful. Megan, have you got any uh, input? Did you say me? I, my thing is, how do, and I just heard, I don't even know if it was Ron talking or not, I'm not, but how can we even expect someone, and this gentleman came with a dump truck issue, how can we expect him to find somewhere to put it? When is his own personal, you know, personal work vehicle? I mean, what, what, where do we go from here? <laughs> you know? If we expect people now, I can understand the tractor trailers wholeheartedly. I do, but this is his personal dump truck in his private yard, and 
we write laws that may make him have to find somewhere to store his vehicle. And it goes for anyone. I mean, I just don't think that's right. And no, I don't want anybody's yard to become an eyesore um, or become inhabitable because of these vehicles. But if this man has had this vehicle in his yard for like, how many years did he say? Like 15, 10, 15? It's almost 20. Yeah. Now it becomes a problem because possibly a neighbor complained. That's crazy. I, I, I just, I can't find the sense in him. This man had this in, in, in 20 years and now all of a sudden he, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. So we can look into this further and then come to back with a proposal, maybe some additional language. Um, one item I would just want to bring up as we're thinking about it, some people may have an unmarked truck, but will have a marked trailer, like a <clears throat> landscape company or something like that. Right now, trailers are still, I don't think, permitted. So I don't know if you want us to address that at all or just go with the actual vehicle. I think we should probably look at everything and, and come to... Uh, uh, I mean, certainly we don't want certain things on the street, but if it's because if, I know that there was an issue one time off of Franklin, I think in that neighborhood, there was a guy that had a trailer, but he kept parking it in the street, but it was one of the smaller streets. Um, they eventually got him to keep it in his yard, which kept it off. So he would just have to back it in. Um, and he had plenty of room in the yard. So I think a lot of times it's as long as they got the room for something, if it's trailers are fine in the yard, okay. yeah. It, to me, I mean, yep. that, that's yeah, I think, I think they're permitted. Uh, right Ma Megan, did you the have any input or comments? Nothing that hasn't already be set, been said. I, I agree with um, April there that we just need to be a little mindful about how we are supporting some of our local workers around here. We do have a lot of people who own their own businesses, and I just want to be mindful that we're not them in the long run with any language but it sounds like we're all on the same page of we want to take a look and see if we can't get a little bit more specific with the language and i think we'll we'll fix a lot of the issues we were having all right thank you all right so i think we're all pretty much on the same page All right, so, so uh, thank you. Um, we'll we'll work on this, and then uh, hopefully uh, we'll have something to to a little more definitive and and effective. And yeah, we'll propose some code changes. The one thing that I will add in relation to in relationships to business operating out of a residential property, one of the restrictions based on those properties is that the surrounding community won't know you're operating a business out of your property. Um, if you're operating a business at your residential property. So we might need to look at that as well if we, you know, and I, I know that they're not, but yeah. I just, I, I people think, can well, continue. Well, I mean, you even look at people who have bed and breakfast, not an Airbnb, but just a regular bed and breakfast, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in some of the homes, you know, that, that are suitable for that. I, right. In my neighborhood, there's uh, someone who is building an addition onto their house and they're opening a hair salon. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have a problem with it. Right. I mean, not that I'm going to use their services, mm -hmm. but uh, so I cut my own hair. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, I think maybe that's something we should take a look as well. Okay. All right. I mean, you know, as long as it's not going to be, you know, 30 cars sitting outside trying to get in, you know, it's usually, you know, appointment based mostly and like photographers and, you know, there, there are several of those in the area that operate out of their homes. Right. So, yeah, I think maybe that's something we should take a look at as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, we'll go, before we go into the special meeting, we'll just go around, do uh, comments. Um, April, you have any comments? Um, all I have to say is be mindful of COVID. <laughs> COVID is still going around. I'm not saying I have it. I don't feel well, but I just want people to realize that we still have to continue to social distance. And if you're not feeling good, stay home. <laughs> Just stay home. I mean, that's the safe way to keep someone else from being sick. 
Um, that's why I stayed home today because I don't want anybody else to feel like I'm feeling right now. Um, make sure you get your COVID shots, your boosters, wear your mask if you can, because I know someone, some people have upper respiratory issues that they can't wear the mask and I'm one of them. I try, but it's, it's hard. I can't breathe, but make sure that you do and take the proper precautions to stay safe. Thank you, April. Megan, any comments? None for me today. All right. Michelle. I'm just going to second what April said. Get your booster if you haven't already. Um, and uh, just a heads up, folks, if you're feeling bad, it may not just be allergies. So just be careful. And since uh, Angela and Mayor Heath are not here, I'm just going to remind everybody, if you're able to, please give blood. Uh, contact the uh, blood bank if you're able to do it, and they will be more than happy to hook you up. So, uh, Mr. Kitzrow, any comments? Um, just one quickly. We do have a new person join us. He's got his fancy name tag, so I'll let him uh, say hello in a second. Uh, we're starting to get into event season now that the weather is turning. In a couple weeks is the marathon, uh, April 1st. So looking forward to that being back downtown and throughout the community. So uh, yeah. good evening, everyone. Yeah, I'm happy to be back. And it looks like uh, Mr. Heath told me a story about what was going to be on my nameplate there. So I'm glad that didn't show up. And I won't share that with you. Here. <laughs> uh, I'll do that some other time. But I uh, know I'm just trying to get my uh, sea legs back started on Monday. Uh, picked a bad uh, day to start with the time change. Uh, but anyway, I, I made That's it through rough. last week and I'm back here again. Happy to be here. So All looking right. forward to working with you again. Glad to have you back. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, we will close our, we will adjourn from our work session and we will, I will entertain a motion to, uh, well, call the uh, special meeting uh, to order and entertain a motion to adopt, adoption of a special meeting agenda. So moved. moved. Give that one to April. Um, Joe. All right, I'll entertain a motion to approve ordinance number 2786. This is the first reading of a budget amendment of the FY23 general fund budget to appropriate funds for the fire department's vehicle repair account. Ms. Boucher, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be back. Ordinance number 27. Oh, I, I need a motion and a second. Yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> so moved. Oh. I got a I got second. second. I'll second. Over anxious. Yeah. <laughs> ordinance number 2786, an ordinance of the city of Salisbury approving a budget amendment of the FY23 general fund budget to appropriate funds for the fire department's vehicle repair account. Whereas the fire department has the need to maintain its fleet by performing regular maintenance and repairs, and whereas the fire department has experienced several unanticipated repair costs and price increases impacting the FY23 budget, and whereas the fire department has an immediate and urgent need to service and repair several pieces of equipment. And we're asked to cover the current and expected cost for repairs. The fire department is projecting a shortfall of funds in the vehicle's account for the remainder of FY23. And whereas there are insufficient funds available in the FY23 fire department budget to cover these required expenses, and whereas a budget amendment as provided herein must be made upon the recommendation of the mayor and the approval of four-fifths of the council of the city of Salisbury. Orders number 2786 reads as follows. Section 1, the City of Salisbury's fiscal year 2023 general fund budget B and hereby is amended as follows. A, increase the current year surplus account 01000-469810 by 50,000 and B, increase the Salisbury Fire Department's vehicle account 24035-434308 by that same amount, which is $50,000. Questions or comments? Call, call, no. Call, call for the question. All those in favor of approving ordinance number 2786 for first reading, please signify by saying aye. 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 And the and chair, the chair opposed, and the chair votes aye. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Nobody here for public comments. We already did that.
This time, uh, the special meeting for the Salisbury City Council is adjourned.